dominates over other sources of noise like bit flips or, or whatever else. And we expect this to be true for many useful systems, for example, superconducting flux qubits. And so we want to be able to design error correcting codes and then fault tolerant gadgets that can take advantage of this uh, dephasing bias in the noise. So we'll use Bacon Shore codes, which we've heard a lot about in this conference, so I'll just briefly review their properties. So they're a family of quantum error correcting subsystem codes. They encode a single qubit into an m by m block of physical qubits, and the asymmetry in the title refers to the fact that we'll consider codes which are, say, wider than they are tall. And what that corresponds to is that we have independently tunable different levels of ZNX error correction. Uh, for example, this 3 by 5 block which I've depicted can correct up to two Z errors and then a single X error in addition. So we have visors of this form where the stabilizers are a product of X's along two adjacent uh, columns or Z's along two different rows. And the logical operators, again, are a product of X's along a single row or Z's along a single column. We also have this, this gauge structure of, of gauge qubits, which we don't use to encode information. And we can think of the, the gauge qubits as being generated by translation of, of these two patterns, either Z's uh, in, a, in a vertical alignment or X's in a horizontal alignment. And what this essentially corresponds to is the fact that the only the, the, the parity of, the, say, the Z information in a single column matters because any other information we can remove by application of the gauge qubits. And another nice property which we've heard about is that using these vacant short, using the gauge qubits, we can actually build up a measure of, say, a stabilizer. And so we can do, you just use two-body uh, interactions to, to build these up. So to do error correction, imagine we have some pattern of of Z errors that has occurred, then we can measure using the XX gauge operators. We can measure the, uh, the parity information in each adjacent two qubits, and we can build this up into a stabilizer. And then we can continue doing this for each <coughs> pair of columns to get the syndrome information. And then using the syndrome information, we can, we can apply a correction. Say, in this case, we would apply it based on the syndrome to the, the, put a Z in the first two columns. It doesn't matter where. And then after we apply this correction, it may look like we still have a lot of errors. But actually, all these uh, remaining operations are just gauge of freedom. So there's no information encoded in them. So this is uh, equivalent to no error. In general, the error correction will fail if more than half of the columns of the code have an odd number of Z areas, errors or more than half of the rows having an odd number of X errors. And because we change, we have different length and width of the, of the block, we, we have different protection. So, so we've seen how these codes offer different power to treat Z errors versus X errors. And now I'm going to show you how we can also design uh, fault-tolerant gadgets that, uh, that provide protection, again, treating uh, Z errors uh, giving more protection to Z errors than X errors. And some of the key ideas uh, in this construction are that we use a, a fundamental gate set, which is compatible with this idea of, of bias noise. Uh, we, we use a teleported CNOT gate as our main uh, encoded uh, gate. And uh, we apply magic state distillation to achieve a fully universal set of gates. So what I mean by a bias-compatible gate set is that we want our uh, Z errors to be more common than X errors. So if we have a gate like the Hadamard gate, which transforms a Z error into an X error, then we'll automatically lose that bias, even if the Z errors started out as more common. Every time we hit a Hadamard, they would, we would start to get more and more X errors. And we also want to try to avoid cascading errors in gates, as in, this, in the CNOT, where a single Z error can propagate to two Z errors on the output. Or similarly, a single X error can propagate to two X errors. So for our fundamental gate set, we'll choose just three operations. Uh, preparation of qubits in the logical plus state, uh, the controlled Z or controlled phase gate, and measurement in the X basis. And 
the uh, controlled Z gate has some nice uh, properties, so a Z error would just uh, would just commute through it, and an X error will produce on the output an X error, and also a Z error on on the other output. So errors can only spread as far as uh, a qubit that they come from, or a qubit that's directly connected to that qubit through a C controlled Z gate. And also depict these uh, pictorially as follows. So a, a plus will indicate this plus preparation. This will indicate a controlled Z gate. And this will be a, a measurement. So we'll start with this fundamental gate set, which I've described. And we'll use our Bacon Shore codes to implement this, this other gate set. And at that point, we'll have some weaker level of noise. And we'll have lost the bias in the noise. And so to reach uh, arbitrarily low noise, we can top of this an additional code. And we'll use uh, magic state distillation, uh, state injection and distillation to uh, provide a universal set of gates. We might also be interested in the case where after the Bacon Shore code, even though the error isn't arbitrarily low, it, it's low enough for our purposes. And in that case, we can just inject and distill directly into the, the uh, universality. So to do the teleported controlled NOT gate, we'll use this circuit here. And to see why this produces a, a con controlled NOT, I'll just consider the case, for example, where the, the first input is 1 and the second input is 0. So we should expect the second input to be flipped by the controlled NOT. And in, in this circuit, the, uh, the control qubit comes in on this block and comes out here. And the target qubit will come in on this block and exit on the fourth block. So these are all uh, logical operate operations. So if we measure the first uh, ZZ measurement, then that'll project onto the, the portion of this code with uh, this uh, state with even parity on the first two qubits. And then when we measure the second one, we project onto even parity of these last three, so we end up with just this state. And if we measure the intermediate two, we're just left with exactly what we wanted. We've, we've flipped the, the second bit. Uh, this circuit will also inherently perform the uh, error correction. So we, we basically teleport the information onto these fresh ancillas every time we go through a controlled NOT gate. So we have three components we need to do. We need to do plus preparation, and the way we can do that, first by preparing each qubit in the, each individual qubit of the code block in a plus state. This will commute with all the x-type stable operate, uh, stabilizers and do the correct thing, but it doesn't commute with the, the z-type operators, so to fix that, we'll, we'll measure those, and we can do that by introducing some ancillary qubits, preparing them also in the plus state, and then coupling them with these uh, controlled phase gates, and if we measure the controlled phase gates, if all these results were zero, then we've prepared exactly the state plus. Uh, if these results are different, then we've actually prepared some other state. But it only differs by local poly operations on individual uh, qubits. And we can just keep track of that. And we should repeat this measurement multiple times for fault tolerance. So to do an X is actually very simple. We, just, we can just measure each of these qubits in the X basis. We form groups according to the, the column and compute the parity of the result of each column. And we simply take a majority vote of the outcomes, the parity outcomes of each column. So this is a very simple X measurement. And we want to do Z measurements as well. And we want to do this in a non-destructive way. So we want to just take out the, the parity information and not disturb the the rest of the state. We can imagine doing this with a single ancillary qubit for each row, which we prepare in the plus state, uh, interact with controlled Z gates, and measure. Uh, and then we take the majority vote of the, the row outcomes. This might have a problem because uh, it's not fault tolerant since a, a single error on a single X error on one of these ancillary qubits could propagate to errors on all of the uh, data qubits. So a possible solution is to use a 
structure like this, where these are where we prepare this. And what this essentially does is it prepares a cat state along this block and this block. And then we, we use the cat state to, we put the cat state, the parity information out of the cat state and measure it. But then there's a trade-off involved because now we have a, a very large cat state. And the larger it is, the, there's more chances for it to have errors. So we could imagine some intermediate trade-off where we have some smaller cat state. And now there are one to many errors, but, but there's a, they can't propagate as far. And so perhaps there's some tolerable trade-off, especially since the, the x errors are assumed to be less common. In any case, to show how this uh, measurement works, we prepare all the ancillas in plus states and measure these intermediate ones, and we prepare a cat state of the on these qubits, one for each row, and then we couple the data qubits to the cat state, and we, we measure each of the qubits in the cat state, and that will tell us the the parity information. Again, we have the problem where these, uh, these measurements are, are, non, are not all zero, then we haven't prepared exactly the cat state we've wanted, but we know how it differs from, from the cat state that, we're, that we do want. And to do these longer ZZ and uh, Z parity measurements of two blocks or three blocks, we can just imagine extending this cat state to the adjacent blocks if they're arranged kind of adjacent to each other in a, in a ribbon. So to analyze the, uh, the error, we will study this under a, a local stochastic uh, bias noise model. So there'll be two separate error rates, epsilon for dephasing errors, and a second rate, epsilon prime, for arbitrary errors, which is assumed to be weaker. Uh, we'll define the bias as the ratio of these two error strengths. Uh, as I mentioned, a key difficulty is ensuring that the cat states are prepared correctly, because if there's some errors during those measurements, and we assume the, the wrong we assume that the cat state is something that it's actually not. That could actually lead to an error almost immediately. And so we need to be very careful in the analysis for that. And once we've taken care of all these things, we can arrive at an analytic upper bound on the effective noise strength. It's just a polynomial in epsilon and epsilon prime. And its degree is given by the, the code parameter, the, the block size, and, and the number of times we repeat each of these different kinds of measurements. And so we can. For a given error strength and bias, we can search for the, the best parameters that minimize the, the effective error strength. Uh, and that's done in, in this plot. So here we have five different values of the bias, going from 10, uh, sorry, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000. And you can see for, for the bias equals 1, these codes actually don't, in this range, they don't do any better than uh, than not encoding at all. But once you go to higher and higher biases, they do better and better. So at a bias of 10 to the 4, we have a, threshold, a pseudo threshold around 2 times 10 to the minus 3. And uh, at an error rate of 10 to the minus 4, we can get an effective error strength, which is below 10 to the minus 13. And so again, each of these points is, represents a different uh, value of all these code parameters, the, side, the length and width and the repetition rates. And so we've optimized at, at each point. Uh, can also look at the, uh, the resource requirements for this code. So in this plot, uh, again, we have this time just four different values of the bias. And we can see that they, uh, as you go to higher and higher bias, you can, you can do better and better. And this black curve shows some data from a survey of codes at, uh, for depolarizing noise and, uh, and a numerical study of how well these codes perform in terms of this x-axis, which is the number of uh, controlled not for the black curve or controlled z-gates for the other curves, the number of those gates in a given uh, rectangle versus the, uh, the logical failure rate, assuming a physical error rate of 10 to the minus 4. And that if, if, you, if you had some bias 
say 10 to the 4, but you ignored it, you would probably get very close to this black curve and, and changing different, through different kinds of codes. But if you use the, if you take advantage of this bias, you can actually get to codes which, for, a, for the same overhead in terms of number of gates, give you uh, increased amount of protection. Uh, so to summarize, we've designed fault tolerant gadgets for these uh, asymmetric bacon shore codes. We have a provable upper bound on the error rate, which achieves a significant reduction in the error strength for uh, a, a modest number of gates. And uh, because of the structure of these bacon shore codes, we can actually uh, possibly also lay out these qubits and gates in a geometrically local fashion as well. So thank you. Questions for Peter? If my brain were working, I could probably work that out from your resource slide, but for, for uh, say, 10 to the minus 4, where you had really low error rates, uh, with mm -hmm. I, I forget what the bias was, uh, how many levels of concatenation, is it just the two, the two layers, or do you need more? So, so for, these, for this plot, it's just, the, it's just the bacon shore code, and there's no second level of concatenation. Uh, presumably, you could do something similar with a with a planar code. Mm -hmm. If you just uh, want to encode a single qubit in a planar code, you could make its dimensions asymmetric. Right. Uh, how does this scheme compare with that? Have you thought about that at all? Or yeah, so I haven't done any analysis on that, but it's definitely true that you you could think of other schemes where you could, where you have tunable independent control of these the, by a different size and and length. Yeah, so all the, the gates are two qubit operations. Oh, so so you mean this picture? So the uh, uh, essentially what you're doing is you're preparing uh, you're you're doing a, a Transversal uh, controlled phase gate with a with a twist between the, these blue this blue thing, which is the the data qubit, and then the other qubits are are uh, a second code, which is kind of the the opposite. So if this is a three by five or two by five, then the other is five by two and is prepared in the plus state. Uh, but but these uh, these intermediate qubits are just used to to prepare the cat state, and the reason for preparing the cat states are to to prevent this problem of of from this previous slide where where a single x error on one of these ancilla qubits could lead to could lead to multiple errors on the output. So, yeah. Let us thank Peter and the rest of the speakers today. And, and let's.